Well, there was the talk from um, last year and the year before. Um, so last last year was was during that meeting at Manchester University. Uh, it was part of a sort of a mammal reunion. Okay. And um, you covered the end of leadership. That's right. Yep. Okay, and I remember. Then you were looking at um, ethics, really, some some sort of okay basis for, for f- okay. future activity. I'm with you. Yep. Right. So if you want to go back to the end of leadership, I'd go back as far as the um, the first Maslow Theory at Work conference, that sort of time. Um, okay. Because that seems, seems to me that leadership started soon after that, let's say, around about the 2000, soon after 2000. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So would, would you say a bit about the, the learning company and those ideas that existed really at the, at the start of those conferences, at the beginning, from what I can remember? Right. Um, well, the learning company... Uh, Predates that by probably a decade or so, uh, 1990, uh, which I said over lunch. Uh, that was the year that the um, Sengi's fifth discipline uh, came out, uh, and our learning company one, I think, came out in 91, but we published stuff then back in 89. And obviously, for us and presumably Peter Sengi, there was five or more years before that when we um, were researching it and the like, um, and the learning company, or learning organisation kicked in, as, as I said over lunch, um, Mark Eastby Smith and various others make a distinction between learning company, which is the more applied design science uh, normative, you know, what to do to become a, a learning organisation and the advantages of it, and organisational learning is the more analytical science. Uh, which on this occasion kicked off probably mid mid 1990s and sort of gave way probably with four or five years later a bit to knowledge management, which I'm sure you've heard of. Um, and uh, they hadn't been going long on that theme when they discovered that they needed to understand knowing. So knowing as a process creates knowledge. Um, Knowing in that sense is another word for learning. And a bit, a bit later still, following that stream and tradition, uh, the term dynamic capability came into being, uh, which is again learning organisation by another name, uh, probably not using the old word, which may, may have its advantages. I remember um, in the early days of learning company talking to the personnel director of Boots, the chemist chain, and he said, well, we think of ourselves as a learning company, learning organisation, and use it, but we don't come out in public because my managing director and I agree that the stock exchange will think we've gone soft, um, oh. <coughs> which I think is quite interesting. Um, so anyway, probably um, late 90s, early uh, 2000s, dynamic capability uh, became of interest. Um, uh, and that has a slightly different um, theoretical and, and practical base. It um, relates largely to economics and resource based view of the firm and um, takes the line that there are, kind of, there are primary value chains which create uh, goods and services and add value to something and generate the profits. Uh, and then there are second order value chains that develop and change and enhance and innovate the primary value chains. The most obvious example would be research and development, which has been you know, obviously around for forever. Um, <clears throat> and um, just about any other um, <clears throat> business function, if you like, that has a primary value chain, potentially also has R&D applied to it. R&D, I guess, usually applies to production, goods and services your accounting system, your marketing systems, your personnel systems and so on and so forth. Um, and I think, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure, I mean leadership, the interest in leadership, I think followed on largely from the virtualization of organizations. Um, 
and knowledge work and knowledge managers. Um, there are three tests, uh, in my view, of a, of a virtual organisation. Firstly, the people in it spend a large proportion of their time in front of a screen of one kind or another um, and work independently. They can telework, work at home, work in the office, work on a train, work in Starbucks, because uh, it doesn't matter where they are. Um, the second one is a large amount of the transactions uh, and databases are used and accessed virtually. So um, again, you can work all over the world. In, in the old days, I worked with the SO Research Laboratory in Abingdon. This was probably in the 70s. And then they would relocate uh, researchers and their families and so on from all over around the world to Abingdon. If that's where they decided to locate a particular project, they would move them, hire them houses, pay their golf club fees, put their kids into private schools. It was an expensive operation. Whereas these days, um, uh, the researchers stay put. Exxon then had research labs in Linden, New Jersey, Abingdon, and somewhere in Germany. Um, but these days, they would, they would stay put. They would work virtually, um, fly together for a meeting, you know, two or three times a year, maybe for a couple of days in a, a hotel near an airport or that kind of thing, um, and carry on like that. Um, so it's more flexible and more economical. Um, uh, <coughs> back in the early days of learning company, um, we found that British, when British Airways was being sued by Virgin for poaching passengers in airports. Um, they were in the courts over that. Nonetheless, they were collaborating over um, spare parts. They had a shared database between Virgin, British Airways, and Boeing. So if an engine car was needed, only one other needed to stock it, and they could ship it around. And they were doing that while they were fighting tooth and nail in the courts. So that's kind of the, the way of the world. And that, you know, that was back in the, in the 90s. Um, and lastly, a virtual organisation deals with its customers and stakeholders and suppliers virtually. So, <coughs> Amazon bookshops, for example, um, would have, um, what has a warehouse somewhere, I think that's one somewhere by the M6 in the UK, but they deal with their um, customers largely or entirely virtually and probably their suppliers too. I remember working with Lego, the kids building bricks which in the UK is just a distribution company. But on the sales side, they move from blokes, and they probably were blokes, going around in full cortinas uh, with clipboards to corner shops, toy shops. And then the world moved to things like Toys R Us. Uh, so marketing becomes doing the deal with Toys R Us, agreeing where the display is, which is critical to marketing, uh, doing the deal, and they plug in their point of sales, tills, machines, so when the stock's deplete in a branch of Toys R Us, it automatically triggers a delivery from the um, Lego warehouse and the bills and invoices follow on automatically. So marketing becomes doing the deal. Um, but the, 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 la the leadership interest... Yeah, I'm just getting to that. But uh, a strong argument as to why leadership became of interest or why the interest was renewed um, is because workers become knowledge workers. <coughs> so they, they're not, uh, in Marxist terms, they don't need access to the machine bolted to the factory floor. Uh, they can work for anywhere and they can walk out of the door with a large proportion of um, corporate knowledge either in their heads or on their hard disks. Um, but going back a bit, management only really came in with the Industrial Revolution, um, <clears throat> which is what, early 19th century? Um, prior to that, it was kind of leadership, more, you know, more people. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, so management, uh, as we know it, fits with the industrial era and sort of ends, ends with it. <coughs> and even... Um, uh, if, if you take the example of farming, um, uh, <coughs> which, is, which precedes engineering in many ways, but as soon as uh, the industry got going, um, 
it became industrialised, you know, with uh, a few exceptions of green and eco farming and uh, organic farming. Um, but um, where am I going with this? <coughs> um, yeah, so you know, it's, it's said that the only difference between a farm and a factory is in the factory the goods go through the machines, and on the farm the machines go over the goods. So you have the, you know, the tractor putting the plough or the fertiliser thing or the seeder or the um, harvester or whatever it is. And probably these days, um, the, if you take um, the fertiliser spray or the insecticide spray, that's probably controlled by um, a computer in Monsanto head office, wherever that is, uh, which kind of rotates readings on the state of the soil and decides the dose and the farmer is probably still driving the tractor, <coughs> probably on his mobile phone or surfing the net, looking at goodness knows what, and probably before long the uh, tractor will be driven by a robot and so you get a little round thing to cut your lawn that's kind of robotic and zigzag up and down the lawn and does it without being pushed or pulled or something. I don't see what, what you're saying on no, why, why the, the ideas around leadership um, well, the, ar the, the argument, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the sort of interest. Well, the, argue, the argument is in managing people. Um, if it's just telling people what to do, you can rely on them wanting or needing to do it because they need access to the machine to be able to add value to something and get a proportion of that back on a wage. Um, and you'll remember the term Ludditism was was originally the people who went into the factories and tried to smash the machines because prior to that um, all and cotton mating was a cottage industry so they were very understandably and rationally trying to hold that back and keep, keep, keep more control of it from the workers point of view um, so they roll that forward when the, the knowledge worker with their laptop and their mobile phone sitting in Starbucks or whatever um, doesn't really need the employer in the same sense. So they need to be led, they, the leader needs to give, think more about what's in it for the worker than was previously the case, and that's the argument. But, but what I noticed that the first two management theory at work conferences, the, the second one had a much greater emphasis on leadership, and ideas about learning organisations or learning companies were much more in the background. And yeah, I think that, what that, you're saying at the moment, it, it seems they're quite compatible ideas. Really. I think they're, I think they're, they're compatible. Um, and time-wise, learning organisation, learning company came a bit before the renewed interest in in leadership. <coughs> um, but to, 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 to some extent, the independent streams and leadership kicks in according to this argument with the virtualization of organisations of work. And I'm sure, you know, as in my examples of uh, Lego and British Airways, um, there's a relationship between virtualization and learning organization, certainly in the sense that um, uh, virtualization probably makes many of the organizational learning processes easier to design and implement. But it's a kind of indirect, the semi-separate semi stream. So, the so do you see more of a future for leadership now? Um, <coughs> We're thinking maybe a year or two years ago. Um, yes, well, my beyond leadership argument uh, <coughs> is based on the idea that um, um, there's a purpose, this is according to Keith Grimt, who's probably the leading British leadership guru, with the possible exception of John Adair. <coughs> um, there's a pendulum that swings between scientific management and human relations. And the argument goes that the credit crunch was kicked off by. Um, those subprime prime mortgage packages. Um, <coughs> and the rotten apples and the green lines. Um, <coughs> but because they were filled by leadership and people, mission, vision, empowerment, and all that stuff, which I've got nothing against, but they didn't have or ignored the science. So they were too far that way. And I did this, um, I did this at the Charles Institute Personal Development Conference in November or October 2011, I think it was, and on the panel with me was the personnel director of the Royal Bank of Scotland, um, which was a prime mover, as you'll recall, in this, this stuff. 
And he said, it, it, it's worse than that, John. We've got shed loads of analysts who knew exactly what was there. It's just we didn't listen to them or ignored them if we did. Um, and it rolls on from there. <coughs> but I argue I'm not saying the leadership is, is gone or finished. Um, but there are kind of three themes uh, to, uh, to where it's going and some unidentified one. So one, perhaps obvious, is correcting the um, uh, human relations scientific management balance. And um, interestingly, as a bit of a sideline, but a relevant one, total quality management in all its various forms is probably the greatest survivor of all the chain recipes around. And I think the, the reason is, or a substantial reason is, that they, they combine the scientific and the human relations. So you've got statistical process control, for example, on the one hand, and um, Kaizen and quality circles on the, on the kind of human relations side. So it actually gets the mix of our right, and that's done since well, the early post, post-World War two years, which is quite some time. Yes. You're in my lifetime, we'll probably just about. Um, so there's that one. <coughs> and then there's the virtualization of organization we just talked about. <coughs> but you know, the question is, uh, do virtual teams and the like require a different kind of leadership? <coughs> now I think at the moment um, it's just seen as group work and leadership by a different sort of communication medium. But I think... Um, perhaps shortly, and there's big money to be made out of whoever cracks this one, there'll be a new, new form of leadership uh, that's more um, generic to, um, to virtual groups, teams, organisations and the rest. And there's a lady called uh, Shazana Zuboff, a Harvard Business School professor, who wrote um, a book called In the Age of the Smart Machine, and that was about IT. And she says, and I'm sure she's right, the first thing we do with IT is, is automate. So we put the payroll on the um, <coughs> on the computer, we set up a paperwork system, um, just about you know, any, anything else. We replace people with robots where they're re- re- more economical. In some areas it's probably cheaper to use cheap labour in China or India or one of those developing countries. Well, that won't last forever. Some countries like Singapore have jumped over that and gone to the high value added sort of knowledge work without passing through the, um, uh, <coughs> the cheap labour thing. In the same way, many countries skip um, landline telephones and go straight onto satellite and mobile, mobile phones. Um, but she says um, later on comes what she calls from information to open to from automating to informating, and that's similar to what I said earlier about making organisations at least internally transparent uh, and moving things on in, in that kind of way. Now, I think there's a, going to be the leadership equivalent of informating uh, coming on sometime, and I don't know, other than what I'm saying now, what, what that will look like, so I think that's um, there's all to play for under that heading. And the last one that I think you mentioned was a, a theme of at least the second um, management theory at work conference, which has come to do with ethics, values, morality, and all the rest of it, um, which again has been a kind of scandal alongside the um, credit crunch and some private mortgages. And I guess um, in various ways that is being and will need to be addressed more. That's about as far as I get with where the Egypt's going at the moment. Going back to the learning, learning company and Seth Sengi's work, so essentially the, the, the one difference with his, his approach is the systems aspect. Whereas at yeah. Lancaster, the, 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 Ch- Chapman did a lot of work at a certain sure, sort of time. Sure. But it was, it was seen, some of the management learning and management science were different, different bits of the discussion. Well, yes, I, I, I think they were. Um, our ne- neighbouring department, which was the Department of Behaviour and Organisation, is, is now the Department of Organisation, Work and Technology. So they were on to it. But I, I mean, I think we were.
I think I think you're right in saying that um, uh, saying your fifth discipline model has all kinds of aspects to it, but the integrating core is system theory. Uh, <clears throat> but I think you could say the same of as some um, of the learning company, um, because I, <clears throat> we have well we have two ways of describing it, presenting it. One is the eleven characteristics. Um, and they are a mixture of the hard and the soft, the scientific and the human relations. Uh, so there's accounting systems and the like, uh, but also self-development for all, so that, like TQM, which in many ways it is a successor to or development of. Um, uh, <coughs> that seems to work. But the other um, way we are describing is what we call the e-flow model, <coughs> which is um, for interacting circles, two figure eights if you like. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a bit like the cold learning cycle, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, um, so in no particular, well actually starting with cold, the bottom horizontal figure eight is the cold learning cycle twisted. If you imagine twisting a rubber band from a circle into a figure eight, you have, um, um, and we, we call it like thought and action or something like that. So if you think what to do, you do it, you see what happens, you modify it. <coughs> and on the top of that um, is another figure eight, which is the same cold process, um, <coughs> but for the organisation as a whole. And we call it policy and operations, and that means policy, not in the rule book sense, but more in the overall aim objective. We might use the word strategy. <coughs> and operations are the same, so the organisation makes a strategic choice, puts it into practice, see what happens and revises the, um, the strategy <coughs> accordingly. And if they're a stronger learning organisation, if they have a new idea rather than bang it out as a universal policy, like the health service did for example when it said every patient should have a, a named nurse, rolled it out and it somehow didn't work and it faded away. But I think it was our B&Q a number of years ago in an era of labour shortage thought, let's try older people. <coughs> but they thought, well, let's try that out in half a dozen of our um, branches. Uh, so, they, so they tried it. <coughs> um, they, they found it, it worked, that um, older people could do the jobs. But even as you often do with learning, you get one or two surprises, one of which was pilferage went down. <coughs> and, that, and there were two theories about that, why didn't one is that older people like you and me will not be strong enough to lug the stuff away. <laughs> and the other is that perhaps we come from a more honest or honest generation and uh, you pay your money and take your choice. <clears throat> but having spotted that, they then put older people in roles like you know, head of stores or something like that. So that, that's how that works. <clears throat> and then there's a linkage, uh, which I think is quite interesting. So individual learning is not constrained. So on the right hand side, operations and action, uh, people, people's actions are constrained by the operational plan and the boundaries of their job description, which can be very tight or very loose. Uh, but ultimately it's, um, <coughs> it's constrained, it's just a matter of degree. <coughs> um, and on the left hand side, that would be individual thought, ideas, and collective policy or strategy. Now many or most organizations brief down their mission vision statement. <coughs> um, but what they tend to do less is listen to feedback on it. Some do and some don't, but I think more don't than do. So I think um, back in the days of Jackie Rover or Leyland, whoever it was, Graham Day hired the National Exhibition Centre and assembled the troops of Rover, Leyland, Jaguar, whoever they were then, and sort of intoned the mission statement you know, out of a cloud of artificial smoke or background music or something like that. But of course you don't get much feedback from the employees doing that and the employees may laugh and joke about it in the pub afterwards but it may or may not filter back to management. So there's usually a blockage on the way up. Um, there was a, a grassroots um, focus groups in the BBC at one stage um, at the grassroots level they came up with some quite serious problems, bullying for example, um, but the report got um, 
modified and um, cleansed, if you like, as it, as it went up the organisation. So when he got to the controllers, I think, which is what they call the equivalent of a board of directors in the BBC, if the message was, well, things are pretty good, but the chips are a bit soggy in the canteen, that kind of thing. Uh, but the serious stuff had got sort of filtered out. I mean, perhaps people didn't want to career limiting to pass up bad news or, or, or for whatever reason. Um, um, and similarly, operations managers may tell employees what to do. They may or may not listen, though it probably is to their advantage to find out what's gone wrong. <coughs> um, and some problems can be fixed at operational level without tinkering with the strategy or policy. Uh, but others may throw up something more serious than we dealt with that, in which case it has to rush it back to a revision of policy and strategy, which is a neat way of talking about single and double loop learning, if you recall that from sure. Artris and Sean and the yeah. like. So it's the difference between changing the kind of operational procedures, and if that fixes it, fair enough. But if it doesn't, um, you've got to sort of change the rules of the game rather than the way you play it. Yes. Or try and do better things rather than do things better depending on how you want to put it. Uh, <coughs> now the learning organisation model and perhaps others um, in terms of a distinction, a helpful distinction I think made by Peter Senge, he talks about three levels, the, um, the reactive, the adaptive and the generative. generative. So the reactive organisation works on the kind of basis if it ain't broke, don't fix it which often works quite well. The trouble is, as with your car, if it's in the, if, if you don't fix it before it's broken, it may break, break more seriously and more expensively. So it pays to do preventative um, maintenance. So the adaptive organisation, and that's probably where 80 or 90% of organisations are, and, and the, uh, 80 or 90% of strategy literature says you read the environment, forecast how it's going to change and position yourself to take advantage of it, um, <coughs> which is quite a Darwinian adaptive environment. Uh, but Peter Zeng says the level above that, which he calls generative, is that you adapt the environment to suit you, to, to, in your own interest. Uh, <coughs> um, so, for example, um, it, uh, um, a chap called Peter Binns was in the philosophy department at Cambridge, wrote a chapter in one of our books, so when an amoeba is faced with a shortage of water, it shrivels up into a little lump of jelly. And if the water comes back in time, it can rehydrate into a happy little amoeba. But if it doesn't, it's you know, literally dust. Whereas what do human beings do faced with a shortage of water? Well, yeah. uh, what we do, uh, we would uh, build a reservoir. Correct, correct. Yeah, we adapt the environment to suit us. The wrong answer is biting bottles from Waitrose. <laughs> uh, except if you live in Chelsea, perhaps. Uh, but yes, we, we build dams, we dig, dig wells, uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, we adapt the environment to us. And that's what the learning organisation does. So, um, game changes. I don't know whether they do it knowingly or deliberately, but if you remember and you still see the adverts on the, on the television. Um, was it direct line insurance? Yes. Um, but, uh, this was pre-web. Um, but what they did was shift selling insurance from, again, you know, chaps in Cortinas, like my Lego example, and branch offices in most towns and cities, uh, <coughs> um, to doing away with the offices and travelling with salespeople. Um, and initially it was a, tele it was a call in telephone service and they passed on a significant proportion of the savings to the customers so it's a virtuous circle and sell cheaper insurance, do more business, expand that and you'll notice that most traditional insurance companies have opened their online uh, services in parallel with that and all the rest go compare etc etc and of course it's you can still do it on the phone, but it shifted substantially to the web as well. Um, so it fits with that progression of, of virtualization. Um, I forgot what that was in, what the question was that generated all that. Oh, generative, I was yeah, elaborating, and this is to do with 
uh, where the learning organization or learning company might, might go next. Uh, so I think, um, although you can tweak the eFlow model that I described earlier, the four balls, to make it more generative, um, it's a bit of a stretch. I think one could f fix it there. I, mean, there are a number of, I, I did a study uh, with some colleagues for, for, of universities uh, in terms of their leadership development. Um, but applying that model to that, one of the th big differences between universities is on the one hand you've got Oxford and on the other hand you've got the uh, post-92 ex-polytechnics. Now somewhere like uh, Bedford Chile University or University of um, West of England uh, near to you will replace, you know, maybe a quarter of their courses every year with the latest thing in hairdressing or nail painting or whatever. Whereas Oxbridge, uh, probably only two, changes one course every couple of years. Uh, another thing about that is, so they're at the generative level. Um, Oxbridges and the like, from Durham, St Andrews and the ancients in this country. Um, uh, <coughs> uh, whereas um, post-92 ex-polytechnics are kind of hyper-adaptive. I'm very good at that game. Uh, so, now, what, so what's, what takes... Well, let me just finish off on that one. What happens, and I don't say they will, or ever have, but if the Oxbridge type organisations get into trouble, they don't just click down to adapt it because they just haven't got the mechanisms in place. Um, so they, they will go right to the bottom of being um, crisis management, um, reactive, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But <laughs> when it is broken, you haven't even got the toolkit to fix it. And so they're kind of, well, I don't say it has ever happened or necessarily will, but if it did, uh, that it would be quite quite serious. And places like Lancaster and Warwick um, are probably quite good because they, they're kind of between the two, but they still have it. And um, I don't know if you know, but well, you do know, uh, Lancaster University took over the Work Foundation two or three years ago. And uh, my good colleague Carrie Cooper stitched that up in about three weeks, and it was a cheap deal because their pension fund had gone, uh, you know, gone through the floor. So I think the World Foundation was built four for ten pounds. There's some kind of insurance scheme that took care of the pension fund, um, whereas some of the London universities or the colleges of London University. Uh, <coughs> were after it and barely got it to their first committee meeting by the time Carrie Cooper had sort of stitched up the deal. Well, I wanted to go back a bit to things like MOOCs, sort of online learning, virtual learning, because that that's, seems to be an area where Oxford and Cambridge, well, they haven't joined Future Learning, the Open University scheme, whereas a lot of other UK universities okay, yeah. have. I wonder if that's an example of, of adapting to new, new technology, new ideas. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not at all surprised to, to hear you say that. Um, and in a similar way, Oxford and Cambridge were fairly late in the game in starting business schools. Um, business schools started in sixes with London and Manchester, and then there were places like Brantford and you know, Leeds that to some extent in the game, and then it spread. But Oxford and Cambridge with the side business school, um, and on what the other one's called, Judge. Judge of Cambridge side at Oxford. Um, but, I mean, at Cambridge had, sorry, Oxford had Templeton College, which was symbolically on the outskirts of Oxford and built with uh, money from a rich grocer called Templeton, I think he was a grocer. Um, uh, in Cambridge, um, management studies grew out of engineering and production management in the engineering department. Uh, <coughs> This brings up in various places, economics and engineering being from the more frequent ones. Um, <coughs> and, and, and so it goes on. Um, well, I think you're probably right about virtual learning. Some American universities, prestigious ones, uh, have for now put all their stuff online free. Um, uh, so they obviously recognize that it's a, a coming world. And they want to be involved with it, but they need a toe in the water somewhere. Uh, but I suspect Oxbridge haven't very much. Um, 
I mean, for us, that's playing a waiting game in this case. If we, case we made for doing that, if they watch others and climb into the latest technology, uh, they may reap some advantages. I think um, various organisations, British Airways, I think, did, did, don't buy into the latest version of Windows. <laughs> they let it run for a year or two. Right, yes. uh, and then yeah. the other people do yeah. the debugging, and I think <coughs> the same thing happened in retail with point of sales, tills, Sainsbury's, and so on, that other people do the expensive experimentation and pilot schemes and don't get lumbered with any particular platform and kind of climb in when the dust has cleared a bit. It you know, makes, makes a certain amount of sense. Um, but I'm sure it's coming. We've done a study of virtual action learning, that's action learning sets, learning from studying each other's problems. <coughs> um, and there we found a sort of distinction between high tech and low tech. Um, low tech being just simple email exchanges or simple chat rooms at the most, or um, well, that would be intermediate, or telephone conferences, Skype conferences, power conferences, uh, whatever. And non high tech would be. Um, uh, what's the virtual reality? What's that one called? So second life. Second life, for example, yeah. Well, and then mo many of the universities do have um, campuses on second life. Um, probably replicating real universities. In fact, it's hard to find any members of staff around. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, I'm told. <laughs> um, things like Cisco teleconference. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you know, fancy stuff. Um, but perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, the great majority are low tech. And I remember the, uh, the Open University um, held back on moving from paper to virtual to online, or at least entirely. We kept the paper versions open until you know, the great majority of their students or potential students had access to the web. And again, that, that makes sense. Um, does that deal with that one? I mean, there are, there are many. Uh, virtual learning platforms, um, uh, some of them. But from what you're saying, that, that they're as likely to get introduced by a company as, as by a university, would that be right? That the, the sorts of learning technologies are being. Yeah, probably more by. likely. Probably more, more, we did a study of corporate e learning, and the great majority of it is used for um, um, technical training and uh, briefing people on corporate policies. In other words, you know, where there's kind of fairly solid knowledge or skills to be disseminated. And even, I think, if there's uh, some microsystems, when it comes to leadership development, still do it face to face. Either because it works better or because the people spend quite enough time in front of screens anyway, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, and if you want to do a joke, I think it was a chap from some microsystems or one of those like that um, said it's really good. We've got this online module on work life balance. People can do it the evenings and weekends. <laughs> well, the really funny part was he didn't see the joke. <laughs> it tells you something about their culture. Yes, so an, an actual course, but yeah. they break away. It's yeah. still got its. Yeah. And there's a distinction between um, uh, e, e, e learning, or shall we call it, for um, uh, dissemination versus dialogue. You know, hole in the head transfer learning versus people learning through discussion. And mm. um, you get again, it seems to start with um, uh, dissemination, move on to dialogue. So yeah, I mean, you don't leave the dissemination behind. Many many of them have a discussion space as a core and then the resources will transform each around that people can draw more in a pull rather than a push uh, basis, which I think makes a lot of sense. And some of the early kind of platforms were better at that, sort of Moodle or whatever it was. Um, whereas I think Blackboard, as the name rather implies, was very much initially dissemination oriented, but I think it's evolved. And I think they all kind of end much the same in terms of what they have and those minor variations in ease of use and so on and so forth. So I think. There's, a, there's just a few things I'd like to go into a bit of detail. For sure, um, sure. Um, on, the, on the ethics, on the, on, on the talk that you gave last, last year at the Mammal Fair, okay. you said quite a lot about China and about the, the new economies. Okay. On the 
on the numbers, you just didn't see it as sustainable, given that if they just scaled up the lifestyle based on the West. But right. it seemed to me that you, you were asking quite a lot. You were asking them to develop on a, a different ethics basis. Well, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I mean, in terms of sustainability in the, in the, in the strong sense, um, uh, if every Chinese family has a car and a refrigerator, and um, particularly it's not a fashion style of um, refrigerator with whatever they are, the gases that destroy the ozone layer, uh, then we're done for. Um, um, I went to an evolutionary psychology seminar at London Business School a while ago, some there from marketing, and they believe that the number of basic human urges that marketing addresses, one of which they call conspicuous greed, we've noticed conspicuous consumption, buying stuff not for um, its use to us in terms of food and shelter and the like, but more the state flow of a big car, because you, it makes you look good rather than you actually need it, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, others, um, which would include sex, whatever you think of it, um, <coughs> Uh, it's nearly so damaged to the environment. So, you know, if conspicuous consumption stroke grief takes off, we're done for. But if some of the other less um, physical resource consuming motives take off, then there's a, there's a better chance. I'm sure in China and to a lesser extent India, there's quite a lot of cheap labour in the hinterland to go out or keep us going for a number of years, but already. Um, and I mentioned sort of Singapore jumped over the cheap labour stage, and certainly um, India and China, Mumbai and um, Guangzhou is it in the kind of the industrialisation centres. Mm. Uh, they may get into trouble on the ethical front through exploiting cheap and en- cheap cheap labour at the front end. Um, you know, Organisations like Nike and so on try and control it, but with Mixed success, it would seem, uh, um, on an everyday basis, um, and, I, and I think, I mean, I think, um, I think it's true that in China there's more tarmac roads than look, look enough to cover the whole of the UK. In tarmac, it's just the scale of the place, and I've, I've got a slide which I sometimes show of the biggest traffic jam in the world, which is sort of seven right the 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 one the the four or five miles long. Yes. And it's not in Los Angeles, which you might think is the most likely candidate. Somewhere in China, I don't actually know where. Um, but it, it makes you think. But well, the view is largely on the. And of course, they, they would say, um, well, you know, the West has been, you know, producing carbon dioxide and the other naughty things for decades and more. So it's our turn. Thank you very much. Um, and they may, I mean, Michael Porter, who's kind of a great sort of free market economist, a la Adam Smith, says, well, you know, free market will take care of this. In fact, there's an opportunity here for the West to, do, to develop, say, the technology that um, captures the carbon dioxide from coal and pumps it back down into the holes under the ground, where it will stay. And if we can develop that technology, we can sell it to China and wherever. But um, will, will they bother? And they probably won't bother until it kind of is, is in their face. So just as in London, centuries ago, uh, uh, Basil Dio built the sewage, the sewage system uh, only because um, the House of Commons became uninhabitable due to the smell from the Thames. But now we have, well, we've had smog in Singapore, haven't we, recently? And, the, um, and I think in Beijing, um, air pollution is fairly frightening. Chinese people go around wearing masks these days, you notice, yes. even when they come over here. Yes, but I... But it'll take that kind of thing. There's no obvious solution to it. I just wonder how you could talk about it without thinking sudden changes in, in the West as well. Um, well, indeed, yeah. I mean, I think um, evolutionary processes may take, take care of it. Uh, depends whether you believe in sort of tipping points or not. But I think, you know, um, in terms of climate change, almost certainly, yes. Uh, human agency in causing it, more than likely. 
Um, do we know what to do about it? Possibly, and we might be able to prevent it. But are we past the tip tipping point, you know, point of no return, in which case we're done for? That's certain, I, I hope not, but if, if we're not, and there's time for revolutionary processes and free markets are like water to take take care of it. That's so that's the case. But virtualization obviously helps in terms of that theme because um, you know a teleconference or a Skype or whatever is I mean obviously some servers somewhere burning energy. Well that's going to be a very small fraction of all the air airfares and air fuel and stuff that it takes to um, being a face-to-face -face meeting on a kind of global corporate scale. Well, yes. But business schools, one of the things you, you mentioned on, on the yeah, yeah. LinkedIn group, um, you didn't, didn't think they were attracting much interest from the, the sort of internet companies. I, I did indeed, and the like. I, you're right, I did say that, and I think, um, I, mean, I haven't systematically researched it since then, but uh, nothing, well, nothing has ever changed in fact it's reinforced it. So are they doing their own research on their own? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. That, that's worthy of research in itself. Um, some of them certainly have their own corporate universities. Um, uh, I don't know. It, it would be worth asking. Um, McDonald's doesn't don't count, but there's McDonald's University. Um, um, what are the big ones? Uh, well, there's kind of Amazon, eBay, um, I suppose IBM, Apple, um, the sort of intermediate, Microsoft. Um, as far as I know, they don't. Well, IBM may be an exception. They did, I remember, did an MBA at Handy Business School for a number of years. Uh, but generally, I think the model for those organisations, eBay, Amazon, um, <coughs> uh, and, the, and the like, um, they start with a big idea, a uh, creative, innovative idea, usually by one person. Um, it gets rolled out through systems and people um, and runs on that basis. And it's probably too early to know, in a big way, what happens when that goes wrong. Um, IBM is interesting because it, that was the big mainframe. It missed PCs. Uh, it got into PCs eventually. And it missed software on hardware, which created the space for Microsoft. Um, um, and IBM, um, after one or two false starts, turned itself into a consulting company, which appears to be doing quite well. Um, Apple manages to have adapted up to now um, in various kind of creative ways and now it's kind of trod on the software and the hardware leg and, and varied it appropriately. Uh, I think probably the new game in town, you might know more about this than I do, is the move to the cloud uh, for this, that yes. and the other. They're all, they're it's not them. clear whether Apple have got that. I think Microsoft. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I do mean Microsoft, uh, are kind of onto it because they've introduced the Surface, which is um, like a tablet as well on the way to being a laptop or vice versa. Yes. And I was always surprised personally it didn't start there, but you know, I've got both. Uh, I've got the iPad and the, the laptop. Um, but that makes a lot of sense. And I think I noticed Dixon's advertising uh, a Surface and some kind of hard disk which also dumps your stuff in the cloud? Yes, they, yeah. they, they don't back up all your data. I presume you, then you just need um, Wi-Fi access and any kind of laptop, uh, tablet. And, and you any sort of device you can get. get your your mega-sized hard disk is in the cloud so as long as you've got Wi-Fi access. Yes. And I think that's probably where I'll go next uh, in terms of my personal kit. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so what is leadership in these, these new organisations? Partly, for many of them, it's too early to, because they haven't had their first crisis, so to speak. But those organisations are kind of on the way to it. Microsoft, IBM, Apple, um, 
not sure who else. But you, your impression is they're, work, they're working out the theory of that for themselves. They're not, they're not turning to an existing business school. I'm pretty sure that's, that's the case. I mean, they may not even bother with leadership development at all. Um, it may be just they have techies and that's it. And techies are fairly obedient chaps. I mean, in, in the UK, most managing directors are ex accountants. In Germany, they're ex engineers in the main. Um, and um, it's interesting, I hope it's in the tangent, that the two most successful post war economies until fairly recently were Japan and uh, West Germany. Um, and they had two advantages. Uh, in the case of West Germany, more clearly, they, after the war, all the kit was taken away from them, so all the semi obsolete machine tools were shipped to Birmingham. So Mercedes and BMW built brand new stuff from scratch, which is an advantage. And the other big one, uh, I'm not sure about Japan, um, was that they were both sort of banned by industrial law from putting anything into, into armament. So, in the sense of peace, the sort of peace is a continuation of war by another name, they were constrained to fight the war, wars economically. And of course, Japan had the advantage of. TQM, initially an export from America largely, um, and people who were kind of a mixture between academics and practitioners, consultants, I think. Um, but certainly TQM was an area of academic study, the, the learning organisation didn't really take off you know, for decades after its success. And I think America re imported um, TQM at the point, well, of, the point at which, um, you know, there was. City head office in General Motors and notice they work as were coming to work in Toyotas and the like. <laughs> yeah, it was in the eighties. Denning Denning for sure. went back to the eighties. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, you'll know more about that than, than me. Well I know the I know the quality end of it. Yeah, you will be. Which is why I'm very interested in where you where you suggest the links we're learning because I think that's Well it, not it, it's gonna it, 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 it's pretty much in there, isn't that? It isn't it? I mean, Kaizen and quality circles are learning mechanisms, perhaps, and um, whether it's down to TQM or um, cultural practice in Japan, it's kind of um, senior managers to walk the top floor and wear the overalls and have a spell on the production line or the customer interface is much more common, and that's got to feed that often missing upward loop between operations sure. And, sure. and policy. Yes. So I think I, whether it's through TQM or maybe it made, uh, made it fertile ground for TQM is probably quite likely, or whatever the case, although not using the learning organisation words, they were probably into it as a kind of implicit process for quite a long time. Yeah, I, I, I think Deming learned in Japan as much as he taught, but yeah. that's, that's not, that's not always good. There you, there you, go. you know, I think that's an area to look at. For sure. Uh, and work out what, what's happening now. For sure. John, would you say a little bit more about publishing and specifically what you do with, with books? Because you mentioned over lunch that the okay. le learning company is coming back in, in book. Okay, well, we're into the sixth edition. I think the first, the first edition must have been early 70s. Um, I think it was invented in a toilet at Manchester Business School where I was uh, talking to. Um, a publisher from McGraw Hill, um, and he said, "As publishers do, have you got anything coming up?" And I said, "Well, possibly, but is there anything that you're looking for?" And he said, "A, a book that managers could use on the train, in small, you know, 10, 20 minute type bites, to develop themselves." And at the time, I was working with Mike Bevan and Tom Boydell, who were running a lot of exercises in the classroom. And I've just done a study with Roger Stewart on the qualities of the effective manager. So I think we put those together, and that's hardly how I say so there's a diagnostic work, work based on the qualities of the effective manager, which is empirically based, might need some updating. Um, and then a series of exercises which are rather than teacher trainer led, self done with a sort of DIY toolkit, and that's been the structure of the book through the. Um, five existing editions and the immediately forthcoming um, 
sixth edition, but one of the things that's different about the sixth edition is that, as well as being the um, hard copy paperback, it's going to come out as seven, I think it is, Kindle Shorts, which are little packages which you can you know, buy for presumably a modest proportion of the cost. The first one is the diagnostic stuff and the introductory stuff, and the other six are the exercises, I think, the DIY exercises, I think, packaged around the learning area to areas to which they're relevant, and we'll see how that goes. But my understanding is, after, I mean, publishers on the whole seem to me to be remarkably slow in adapting to the virtual world, um, <clears throat> as they are from other things. But I think um, there is a tipping point here which has been passed largely through Kindle, and I think probably it's just gone over 50% of books uh, now come in virtual form through Kindle or like. I think I can get Kindle on my iPad. Uh, don't use it much so far, but certainly I do as much as I can. Electronically, I use EndNote, which is a bibliographical resource, and I keep papers, perhaps rather old-fashioned way, in um, in folders and files, cross-reference to it, and I make various packages of those available to people. I choose through Dropbox, which is, as you know, that cloud-based resource. Yes. Uh, maybe the upper limit of what I can use in that, but there are other ones. Is it? Um, it's not Google, so there's a Google one, and so on. And yes. So forth, yeah, and yes. I just it's not so familiar with um, Dropbox, it seems to work fairly well, it's fairly easy to use. Same way people don't understand. I think if people drag and drop resources out of my file, they can sometimes remove them. Um, so I put it in a warning notice. I've had an episode recently with quite a lot of gone AWOL. Oh, no, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> but there are ways around it, yeah. maybe ways of locking them in or. Um, I certainly put a little note in and tell people to read it first so that you can either, if you open it and save it, you can, or if you transfer it to, um, uh, what a dongle, um, a USB, USB stick, stick right. yeah, that'll do it. And uh, a number of my things are sound files, like this will be, and you can't so open that and save it, so it's, you've got no alternative than to shift it to a USB no, drive or the, or the like. But the, the, the book you, you also mentioned, the, the Learning Company, that you're going to yeah. do a new edition of that. Yeah. Do, you, do you know yet what sort of form that will take as, as a publication? Um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the kind of structure and form is somewhat the same, but the content is modified. So we'll have basic models, like the eFlow models I described earlier, and the characteristics, which may change and probably be. Uh, more virtual stuff in there, more ethical stuff, uh, more on the side. Yeah, they're, they're not they're not absent in the, in the current thing. Um, uh, I'm fairly sure we will apply network theory. That doesn't doesn't just mean social networking. It means networking in, in the broadest sense. Um, so that's you know nodes and links and implosion and explosion. I can say more about those examples if you like um, and more obviously addressing the um, generative levels I talked about earlier no exception in most organisations and perhaps for good reasons are at the adaptive level um, um, but make it more easy for them to see the steps up to the next level as appropriate um, the previous editions had things called glimpses which are like mini or micro case studies uh, which seem to work well, and I'd be surprised if we don't stick with that um, tradition. And I'm pretty sure we'll um, do um, Kindle Shorts or the equivalent or something more fully web-based. Oh, I didn't mention, in, in terms of the Magic Arts self development we're also going to have a website with space for dialogue, discussion groups, oh, right. with and without the authors. We've yet to must get on with that actually. Uh, yet to sort of structure that up, but it, it'll be anything from emails. We'll probably go for the low tech end discussion space. Um, might do a LinkedIn discussion area. Right. LinkedIn being the, yes. I think, more professional of the compared with Facebook and yeah. 
professional. A lot more professional. All that stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, a lot more obviously professional. This is the only one I use to any serious degree. Um, and it has had some benefits. Um, um, and at a personal level, I mean, on the whole, um, you don't make much money out of books. You either have to write a bestseller like Peter Morton or Peter Senge, or write a widely used textbook like um, Johnson & Scholes on strategy. And then you've got a big MBA, master's degree, undergraduate market. They're the big winners. And I think Jerry Johnson makes 25000 a year. Which, you, know, you wouldn't give up a day job for that, but it's quite a useful supplement to your pension. Um, uh, but the main um, benefit to authors, if, if they want a kind of uh, material or financial one, is the consulting and talking that it leads to. Um, and when I used to, when I was feeling cheeky, used to lecture in the learning organisation, as I still do occasionally, I sometimes used to say, you're paying me a thousand pounds or whatever it is, you can buy the book for twenty pounds. You know, what? I mean, I'm sure my jokes and my magnetic personality have <laughs> a lot of value um, and the chance to discuss it with the author but even, even so um, I think that's all but I think I mean, one of the uh, indicators in terms of kind of like the course learning cycle would apply to managers is the kind of activists don't like to be caught reading you know if they're sitting in their oh. office reading a book and somebody comes in and catches them at it it's as though they were looking at a pornographic magazine or something mm -hmm. it's not not but a dumb thing to do. Going, going to a talk or talking to well, someone is, is more active? Mm, that's a good question, yeah. Well, I suppose it's more an opportunity to network and it's often a bit of a, a bit of a treat. So, I mean, often management development, you, you know the hotel called the Belfry towards the bottom of the uh, M5 toll road? Anyway, so it's, a, it's a big posh hotel with loads of conference facilities and a golf course and a bar, of course, and all the rest of it. Um, it's amazing how many management centres, all the, all the hotels that host such, such a preserve, extensive leisure resorts. Uh, and so, I mean, is, is leadership development, um, management development, really a kind of um, capability enhancing exercise, or is it part of the reward package? Um, it usually comes out of recurrent expenses rather than as to, um, you know, kind of, it rarely goes on the balance sheet as an investment, you know, not like football players, for example, with a few rare exceptions. Managers aren't transferred like um, Owen or whatever the star footballers are, millions mm -hmm. of pounds, with the occasional exception, I'm sure. Um, but then again, I do some research, I've got the three, three actual benefits of, of each of our programmes are in no particular order just standing back from work and thinking about it a bit, B, networking with other people, and C, um, hearing the old model that might help you think about the world. For example, Porter's Five Forces, probably top of the pops in terms of that, that kind of thing. So the golf course, you could say what it is, it's a networking opportunity, isn't it? Probably a bit gendered, but not entirely. Not as bad as Finland, where I was once. Um, my colleague Vivian Hodgson, and that towards the end of the day, the Finnish host, a chap inevitably said, Time for sauna. <laughs> and off we go, leaving Vivian at the door. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did we get into that? <laughs> well, just the, the value of whatever of the management development. Oh, yes, yes, networking and, um, yeah. And what came before that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and most most organisations spend a great proportion of the leadership development budget by a long way on senior managers and their successors. Uh, as, uh, as we found it in a study of up to a dozen um, corporations, the one exception in that study was Bernardo's, a charity. Um, Bernardo's only has one children's home left on the expenditure side and spends the rest of its time doing child related uh, projects. But the pinch point in that business model is, is not there, it's on the money generating side. And on all those uh, 
high street charity shops, which are largely or entirely staffed by volunteers. Yeah. So the leadership of the charity shops on the high street tells it that they're both the most problematical and uh, taken collectively the most important from resource point of view. So their leadership development money goes to a large extent on um, on uh, leadership development. Now, of course, senior management leadership costs a lot more. That's you know, a trip to Harvard or whatever. Uh, whereas leadership you know, for the other ranks is probably a lot cheaper. So um, the health service had a program called Leadership at the Point of Care. Uh, I think they put 150,000 matrons or the equivalent through it. I think it was a three day plus one day empowerment based workshop. And although you'd think nurses or even nurse leaders, matrons, jobs are quite constrained, um, <coughs> little things like, for example, and it sounds trivial, taking patients, visitors, and relatives a cup of tea as well as the patient uh, was one of the examples of what some uh, nurse stroke matron did, probably almost only her own initiative. Um, uh, but if 150,000 people do things like that, it probably ends up for something. Yes. And while I think of the health service, of course, virtualization and computer systems is coming, but it's often over budget and underpriced and sometimes it doesn't work. And um, the health it's service is replete of the examples of that, isn't it? Yes. And they're not the only ones. Yeah, yeah so the, the organizations are various. Yeah. But John, we've gone over an hour and seven minutes. How so I think I think we can stop for a cup of tea. Well, well that's any well-organised conference. For sure. Or a game of golf. <laughs> or a swim in the lake. Well, a swim in you the lake. Swim and come around just to show the view. I will. I will just come around. We'll see the cross as well. The other side, which has been a fun.